Okay, good morning, everyone. I had the, the privilege of learning with you last year. I think it was almost exactly a year ago. It was uh, Erev Parashat Pinchas. Then we met in the shul in Bet Knesset Nitzanim in Yerushalayim. Because of the circumstances, we're meeting on Zoom this time. And Be'ezrat uh, Hashem, we should be able to get back again to meeting face to face. And this crazy business should be behind us. I wanted to learn with you this morning. This Shabbat, Be'ezrat Hashem, we are finishing Sefer Bamidbar. And we're also in the midst of the three weeks, Yemei Bera Mitzarim, the days between Yudzayin B'Tamuz and Tisha B'Av. And uh, we're thinking about Chorban Abayit and the causes for Chorban Abayit and what we can do in order to, to see Binyan Bet Bet HaMikdash HaShlishi. We're also living in times where we see leaders. We experienced a president, a Nasi Medina in prison, prime minister in prison, now, uh, uh, many other stories that, that many of our leaders are, are going through, and it's a good time to learn a lesson in leadership. I thought maybe to look at different episodes, different stories that we saw in Sefer Bamidbar and elsewhere in Chumash, elsewhere in Tanakh, to look close up at different leaders of Am Yisrael, and to see what lesson we can learn from them. So we'll begin with the Hakdama that the Nitziv, Rav Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, in his Chumash Hamek Davar, his Perush Hamek Davar, he, he writes an introduction for Sefer Bereshis. And he brings that Chazal calls Sefer Bereshit Sefer Hayashar. And he brings that it's based on a pasuk in Yoshua, Haloik Tuval Sefer Hayashar. So to in Sefer Shmuel, it says, Vayomer Lelamed Bnei Yehuda Keshet Hineik Tuval Sefer Hayashar. And it's referring to Sefer Breshit. Why is Sefer Breshit called Sefer Hayashar? Umefaresh Rabbi Yochanan, Ze Sefer Avraham Yitzchak Viyakov, Shenikriu Yisharim, Shenemar Tamut Nashi Mot Yisharim. So Sefer Bereshis describes the lives of our forefathers, Avraham Yitzchak Viyakov, and they were Yisharim. They were straight people. Who was the first one that called him Yisharim? Dafka Bilam. Bilam says, Tamut Nafshi Moti Sharim, and he's referring to Avram Yitzhak Yaakov. Says the Nitziv, V'yesh lahavin hatam, lama kara bilam et avoteinu b'shem Yisharim b'yichud. Why did Bilam choose this name of Yisharim? Why does he describe them Dafka as Yisharim? V'lo tzadikim, o chasidim. He could have described them with other, many other Adjectives. Why dafka yesharim? Why not sadikim? Why not chasidim? What does it mean to be yashar? Vigam lama mechuneze a sefer biyichud bikinu yesharim. And why is it that this sefer of Bereshis is called sefer hayashar? Ubilamit palel alatzma shiye acharito kumo baalei zeakinu. And Bilam, his his desire is. Tamut nafshi mot yisharim. He wants that his end of life should end up like those that were with the yisharim. What, what, what does it mean to be a yashar? Says the nitziv. V'hayinyan. The nitpa'el b'shirat ha'azinu. Sefer dvarim shirat ha'azinu. Ala pasuk hatzur tamim pa'alo. Tzadik v'yashar hu. HaKadosh Baruch is tzaddik v'yashar. What does that mean? What is tzaddik? What is yashar? Says the nitziv, d'shevach yashar. This 
adjective, this word yashar, who neemar lahatzdik dina kodesh baruchu bechurban bayit sheni. He says this is a reference to justify the act of a kodesh baruchu in churban bayit sheni. What does that mean? Shayad dor ikesh uptalto. It was a very special, unique type of generation then at the time of Bayesheni. What was so special? Upirashnu, says the Nitziv, we explained elsewhere, Shahayu tzadikim v'chasidim v'amalei Torah. In the time of Bayesheni, right, we know the Bayit Rishon was destroyed because of shalosh averot chamurot, avodah zara giloy arayot v'shvichut tamim. That was Bayit Rishon. But by Cheney, they were tzaddikim, hayu chasidim, hayu amele Torah. They devoted their lives to learning. They were tzaddikim. So why was by Cheney destroyed? Says the Nitziv, the reason is they were tzaddikim, they were chasidim, they were amele Torah, but what were they not? Achlo hayu yisharim ba'alichat olamam. They weren't yisharim in their behavior. And he explains, Alkain mipnei sinat chinam shebilibam ze et ze, chashdu et mi shirau shenoheg shelo kedatam birat Hashem shehu tztu kiva apikores. So they were they were tzaddikim, they were Hasidim, they learned Torah. But what was the problem? If they saw someone that was Oved Hashem slightly differently than the way they thought was right? So what did they say to him? You're an Apikores. You hate the Kodesh Baruch Hu. What are you doing? And they reached a level of Sinat Chinam. Anyone that had a little bit of a different of out, an outlook, so he was at Stuki. Who was an Apikores? And this sinat chinam that they had, that led to all the terrible things, and that led ultimately to churban abayit. And therefore, Kadosh Baruch was saying, you know what caused the destruction? The fact that I, Kadosh Baruch Hu, I am tzaddik, but I'm also yashar. It's not enough to be a tzaddik. You have to be yashar. And look at the words of the Nitziv. Very powerful words. Shakarish Borchu yasharu ve'ino sovel tzaddikim ke'elu. Hakarish Borchu is yashar and he can't stand tzaddikim that are not yasharim. Only what type of tzaddikim does he want? Ba'ofen sheholchim b'derech hayashar he doesn't want people that behave crookedly. Even if they're doing things, if they're not yashar, if you're not yashar, it could cause the destruction of the whole world. And he continues, and this was the praise of the Avot, not only were they tzaddikim, were they righteous, not only were they ohavei Hashem, but often hayoter efshar, but beyond that, and what does it mean to be yisharim, says the Nitziv? Hainu, sheitnagu im umot haolam, they behaved and they treated the goyim, Afilo of day elilin mechuarim, even idol worshippers mechuarim, this despicable idol worshippers. How did how did they treat them? Mikol makom hayu imam beahava, vechashu letobatam, and they had good relations with them, and they looked at they they wanted their benefit. Why? Ba'shehu kiyum habriya, because that's what keeps the world going. And where do we see that? Says the Nitziv, Kemosha Anur Goim, Kama Hishtateach Avraham Avinu, Let Palelas Al Stom. Avraham Avinu goes out of his way to beg and to daven for Stom. Afal Gavsha Yasoneotam et Malkam Tachlit Sina Avurishatam. Even though the king of Stom, the people in Stom, 
are the total opposite of what Avram Avinu stands for, and Avram Avinu hates their behavior, but even so, he davins for the people. He doesn't want them to be destroyed. He wants them to continue living, even though he has arguments with them, even though he doesn't agree with what they're doing, but he doesn't want that they should be destroyed. So we see, Bayit Sheni says the Nitziv was destroyed, even though they were tzaddikim, even though they were chassidim, even though they were amele Torah, they were not Yisharim. They hated each other. They didn't have tolerance one another to one another. Sefer Bereshis is the Sefer of the Yisharim. They behaved with tolerance even for Ovdei Elilim Mechorim. And the Nitziv mentioned Avram Avinu's, the way that he went out of his way to Davin for the welfare and to save Sdom. And the the Chassam Sofer, of Chassam Sofer and his Shailus and Chuvis, he has, there's an Akdoma for the Chuvis Chassam Sofer, Chelek Yoradeh. And in that Akdoma, he says something fascinating. He says that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes to destroy Sodom, so the Pesach says, HaMechase Ani Ma'avraham Et Asher Ani Oseh B'Sodom, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, to himself, so to speak. Could I hide back? Could I hold back from Avram? Could I cover from him to hide from Avram Avinu what I'm about to do in stone? I can't hide it from him. I must tell Avram Avinu what's about to happen in stone. Why? Why does the Kaddish Baruch Hu say that he has to share and to reveal to Avram Avinu what he's about to do with stone? Says the Kaddish Baruch Hu, the reason is Says Hashem, I have to reveal to Avram Avinu, he has to be let known, it has to be known to him what's about to happen in Sodom. Why? Why is it so important? Because I know Avram Avinu. Because he commands his children and his household, he educates them, and they keep to the path of Hashem, so since Avram Avinu is teaching his children, he's teaching his family to do, to behave in just, to behave in a straight path, to behave properly, that's why I have to reveal to Avram Avinu What's about to happen in stone? What does one thing have to do with the other? The fact that Abraham Avinu is, is mechanech, his children, properly, so therefore he has to know what's happening in stone, says the Chassam Sofer. Unbelievable. That Abraham Avinu, he looked in the generations before him. And he saw what happened in the world in the time of Noah, that the world was kimat, totally destroyed, even though there was a tremendous tzaddik in the world. Noach ish tzaddik tamim hayavid orotav. There was a tremendous, tremendous tzaddik that the Torah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself, tells us that Noach was a tzaddik. Halavai, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu should say to me that I'm a tzaddik. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us about Noach. Ish tzaddik tamim hayavid orosav. So there's this tremendous tzaddik walking in the ground in the world, but did that help the generation of Dor HaMabel? The fact that they had a Noach there? No, they were all destroyed. Why did that happen? How could it be that there's such a tzaddik, and even so, the world is brought to destruction? Also, before the time of Avram Avinu, there was a person called Chanoch, and the Torah tells us about Chanoch. Ve'inenu ki elokim. He was taken by a Kodesh Baruch Hu. In other words, Chanoch was such a holy person, he became so close to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, that a Kodesh Baruch Hu took him out of this world even before he died, because he was so holy that he couldn't stay in this physical world. 
So Avram Avinu says to himself, look, look, look what happened in generations, in previous generations. There was a person named Hanoch. He was a tremendous tzaddik. Was he able to influence the world? Was he able to save the world? No. There was a tremendous tzaddik. His name was Noach. HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself tells us what a tzaddik he was. Was he able to save the world? Was he able to influence the world? He didn't do it. Avram Avinu reaches the conclusion, that's not what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants from me. Yes, if I'll cut myself off from the people around me, and I devote myself only to my personal spiritual growth, so I will, lead, I will reach tremendous levels of Kedusha. I will reach tremendous closeness to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But what's going to be with the people around me? They'll stay at the low level that they are. That's not what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has enough malachim in Shamaim. He doesn't need another angel. What HaKadosh Baruch Hu needs is a person that's going to devote his life educating others. But if you're going to devote your life to be mashpia, to influence others, it's going to come on your own account. That time that you're going to invest in teaching others, you could have invested in yourself to reach higher levels of Kedusha, to become a greater Talmud Chacham. So you're investing time in others at your own expense. So, so what's better? For example, if we have a group of 10 people and each person could reach their potential in Kedusha, in Ruchmias, to 100%. What's better? It's a better? Is it better that the nine people should reach a level of 10% and one of them should reach a level of 100%? He'll be 100%. He'll ignore everyone else. They'll stay at the low level of 10%. So we'll have nine people that are... Each one 10%, that's 90, plus him who is 100, so we reached 190. As far as the Kodesh Baruch Hu is concerned, so to speak. Or, if I don't reach 100%, I'll reach only 80%, but I'll make sure that everyone else around me will reach, reach 50, 60%. So, for a Kodesh Baruch Hu, he wants that so much more. And that's what Avram Avinu did. Let's read the words of the Chassam Sofer. Says, says the Chassam Sofer, Hora bizeh, ki niflet ahavat Hashem la'avram avinu alav ha'shalom. Avram avinu had tremendous love to our Kaddish Baruch Hu. The Pasuk says, Avraham ohavi. Avraham, he was Hashem's beloved. Why did Hashem love Avram avinu so much? Niflet ahavat Hashem la'avram avinu alav ha'shalom. Al Hashem loves Avram Avinu so much because he didn't only care about himself, but he cared about the people around him. And that was more valuable than the highest to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the fact that he invested time in others that was more important to HaKadosh Baruch Hu than the levels of Kedusha, Kedusha that Avram Avinu himself reached. Ki be'emet, gam nefanav hayu yechidei zgula, asher yadu et Hashem, vedat drachav yechpetzu, ba'abato yishku tamid. Because even before the time of Avram Avinu, there were people that reached great levels of Abbas Hashem. Mi lanu gadol mi chanoch, who can be greater than chanoch? And because of this tremendous love and clinging to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, mit parda chavila chevrat arba yisodot. So he was such a holy person that he couldn't stay in this physical world. Chadal miot adam, he seized on being a human being. And he went up to becoming an angel in heaven, in heaven. As the Pasuk says, God took him to be another angel in heaven. We don't find in regards to Avram Avinu that he reached such levels of Kedusha like Hanoch did. So is Hanoch 
a greater person than Avraham Avinu? Says the Chassam Sofer, no. Ach lo mitzad pchitut v'chisaron nafsho lo higea la ma'ala hazot. No. It's not that Avraham Avinu was on a lower level, and that's why he couldn't reach such high levels of Kedusha. That's not the case. Ki im Avraham Avinu alav ha-shalom haya usek ha-shir asa chanoch. Because if Avraham Avinu would have behaved like Chanoch, and he would have done what Chanoch did. In other words, if he would have separated himself from society, so then he too, he also could have reached the level to be like an angel. So why didn't he do that? The reason he didn't do that is, who it's bonen bechokhmato, kilo be'ele chafetz Hashem. That's not what Hashem wants. She yashlim ha'adam et nafsho levad. That a person should be alone, perfect. Ve'et anshei doro yashir acharav tarbut anashim chata'im u'machisei Hashem. To work on yourself, to become like an angel, and to not care about the people around you. That's not what Hashem wants. That's what happened to door of to the generation of Hanoch for the generation of Noah Dora Mabul. But that's not what Hashem wants. This lesson that he learned from history, the Meroto taught Avram Avinu, Kitov Ladam Lemaet Bashlamat Nafsho, Leman Ribot Kvod Hashem. It's better that a person should maybe diminish a bit his own perfection in order that in the big picture there should be more kvod shamayim to minimize those that rebel a Kadosh Baruch Hu and enhance those that serve a Kadosh Baruch Ki ma'yitenu ma'yosif ha'adam im yosif malach echad al alfei ribevot malachei malach because what is it good for HaKadosh Baruch Hu that a person should add one more malach? There's so many malachim in Shamayim. And therefore, says the Chassam Sofer, why is it that HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to appear to Avram Avinu and to tell Avram Avinu what's about to happen in stone? How come Avram Avinu didn't know on his own what's about to happen? Wasn't Avram Avinu a Navi? Wasn't he a prophet? Aren't prophets supposed to know what, what's going to happen in the future? Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu have to get involved specially to tell Avram Avinu what's about to happen? How come Avram Avinu didn't know? Says the Chassam Sofer, you know what? You know why he didn't know? Because it seems that the level of Nevoa that Avram Avinu had maybe was not the highest level of Nevoa. And that's why Avram Avinu on his own didn't know what's about to happen in stone. But says the Kaddish Baruch Hu, it's not fair. How come he didn't reach such levels of nevuah? Because he didn't only focus on himself. He devoted himself for others. And if he's devoting himself for others because he came to the conclusion that that's what a Kaddish Baruch Hu wants, because it's best for a Kaddish Baruch Hu to have a multitude of Ovde Hashem instead of having one perfect Ovde Hashem like Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu reached the conclusion that that's not what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. It didn't work for Hanoch. It didn't work for Noach. They, didn't, they weren't able to save their generation. And therefore, Avram Avinu devoted himself to teaching others. And Avram Avinu's Talmidim were not the highest level. He had to teach them basics. He had to teach them Aleph Beis. He dealt with people that are of the Abba and for sure, it came at his own expense, and his level of nevua was maybe not so great. And he finishes and he says, "Viyan ki zacha Avram Avinu, halav shalom nemida zu terem tziva Hashem alav." So even before Hakadosh Baruch Hu gave us the mitzvah of ochiach tochiach et amitecha, even before Hakadosh Baruch Hu commanded us to look out for others. Avram Avinu realized it on his own, that that's the benefit of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and therefore he was called Avraham Ohavi. And therefore, a Kaddish Baruch Hu decided that even though Avram Avinu on his own, 
isn't aware of what's about to happen to stone, says Avram Avinu, I must tell him. I must tell him because the fact that he didn't get to it on his own is because he was concerned for a Kaddish Baruch Hu's benefit, so to speak. He was concerned in spreading Torah, in teaching and ed educating those around him. And with this idea, we can understand that when an Amr Avinu comes to dive into a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and he comes to beg for protecting the people in Sodom, so Avram Avinu says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Ulayish, I'm in source number three now, Ulayish chamishim tzadikim betoch ha'ir, ha'af tispeh velo tisa lamakom naman chamishim at tzadikim asheh bekirba, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, says Avram Avinu to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, maybe there are 50 tzadikim. But he doesn't say maybe there are 50 tzadikim. He knows that 50 tzadikim are not good enough. Because Hanoch wasn't good enough. Even though he was a tremendous tzaddik, he couldn't protect his generation. Noach was a tremendous tzaddik, but he couldn't protect his generation. And therefore, Adam Avinu, when he speaks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he stresses, I'm not only looking for tzaddikim, I know tzaddikim alone are not enough. But what, do I, what am I looking for? Ulayish chamishim tzaddikim betoch ha'ir. Maybe there are chamishim tzaddikim asher bekirba. Tzaddikim in its midst. What does it mean, tzaddikim betoch ha'ir? What does it mean, tzaddikim bekirba? Says the Ibn Ezra, and I thank my father, Shlita, for teaching me this Ibn Ezra. Says the Ibn Ezra, v'tam betoch ha'ir. Why, is it, why does Avram Avinu stress tzaddikim betoch ha'ir? Says the Ibn Ezra, shehem yireim et Hashem b'farhesya. That they're over Hashem in public not closed in their home with their shutters down where no one could see them and they're focused on themselves. No, we're looking for tzaddikim betoch ha'ir shehem odem et Hashem b'farhesya. Says the Ibn Ezra v'chen, as we find in the Pasuk in Yirmiya, it says there, Shotetu b'chutzot Yerushalayim. Next source, I bring the full Pasuk in Yirmiya. Yirmiya, before, by, by the time of Khurban Bayis Rishon, he says, Shotetu b'chutzot Yerushalayim, Uru'una, so wander amongst the streets of Yerushalayim, Uru'una ud'u uvakshu b'rechobotea, and search in its streets. Go to the outskirts and the streets of Yerushalayim. If you find a tzaddik who behaves, he's osem mishpat, he's behaving just, and he's mevakesh emuna, he has emuna na kadish baruch. If we find even one of those, ve'eslachla. And I'll forgive them, and there won't be chorban ma'iz rishon. Says the Radak there on Yermia. What does it mean? Bechutzot Yerushalayim ubakshu berechobotea. It's not enough to find a tzaddik within Yerushalayim. If he's closed in his home and he has no influence, he's not going to be able to save Yerushalayim. He has to be berechobotea. He has to be bechutzot Yerushalayim. Says the Radak. Piresh Adoni Avizal. Ki Yermia amar bechutzot Yerushalayim v'amar berechobotea. Why? Because the, the, the Hasidim that existed in Yerushalayim at the time of Ayish Rishon, they were Hasidim there, but they were Hayum Etchabim Bebatehem, they were hiding at home. So they were Tzadikim on their own in their homes, they were scared to go out. They didn't go out, they didn't go out to influence others, says the Radak, maybe they did it because they were scared that the Rishayim would harm them. But the bottom line is that they were tzaddikim, but they were tzaddikim in their homes. They weren't tzaddikim in Chutzot Yerushalayim. They weren't tzaddikim in the Rechobot. They weren't out there in the streets. They weren't having an influence. The Radak in Bereshis on tzaddikim in Tukhair says the same idea, the same idea that the Radak said on Yermia, says the Radak, in regards to tzaddikim betoch ha'ir, and he says, Umasha Omaru bikshu berechobotea, mevakesh emuna v'sveslach, la, hayu bahem tzaddikim ba'atzmam. They were tzaddikim in Yerushalayim, they were tzaddikim for themselves. Ava lahashiv achirim ma'avon, but to have influence on others, to 
to set them straight. But they weren't willing to get out of their homes and to go to the streets and to have influence on others. It's true. Why did they not do that? They were scared to be killed. You're right. They were scared that they would be harmed if they went out and the Rishoyim would catch them, trying to influence others to do tshuva. But what a Kodesh Baruch Hu wants, says the Radak, is that Tzadik will be willing to be Moser Nefesh. He'll be willing to risk his life in order to influence others. And if there would be a tzaddik that would be willing to be Moser Nefesh to influence others, so would there, there would not have been a Khurban. That tzaddik would have the merit to save everyone else. And therefore, when Avram Avinu comes to Davin for the welfare of stone, he knows that it's not enough that there should be tzaddikim. There have to be tzaddikim betoch ha'ir, tzaddikim that are willing to leave their homes, to go out to the streets, to, to be involved with the people. Aye, but it's going to come on their own expense. They, they'll reach lower levels of Kedusha. They'll reach lower levels of Nevoah. So what? Are you in it for yourself? Or you're in it for HaKadosh Baruch Hu's sake? If you're in it for yourself, okay, so you can become a Malach, like Hanoch. You can be like Noach, but you're not going to save the world. If you want to save the world for HaKadosh Baruch Hu's sake, you have to willing to, to, to be willing to even to forgo on a certain level that you could have reached yourself in order to take care of the welfare of the public. So here we see that this was this is the lesson that we learn from Avram Avinu. We learn from Avram Avinu that in order to be a true leader, in order to be able to protect your generation, you have to be willing to have Mesirus Nefesh. And not only mysterious nefesh, but you have to be willing not only to, to be killed in order to take care of the tzibor, but you have to be willing to sacrifice your spiritual growth, growth as well. There's a famous story, a famous story told that when the Balatanya, the Balatanya lived in the house together with his son, the, the, the Rebbe of Baruch Ber, and, um, and, um, and uh, one day the, the, the Balatanya's son was sitting and learning, and he was already a father, and, um, and he's sitting and learning, and his, the baby, the infant, was sitting in the, was lying in his carriage in his crib, and, uh, and the Rebbe was so engrossed in his learning, that he didn't realize that the baby fell out of it, was standing up and playing, and he fell out of his crib. The baby fell out of his crib, and he's crying, and he's crying and screaming. And the Balatanya, he lived upstairs, and he was also learning, but he hears the baby crying. So he goes downstairs to see what's happening, and he sees that his son is learning, and he's so engrossed in his learning that he's not even aware that his baby is on the floor crying because the baby fell out of the crib. So the, the Rebbe Balatanya picked up his grandson and he calmed him down and he sang to him until he stopped crying and he put him back in the crib. Later on, when he was talking with his son, he gave him Musr and he said, what is your learning worth? If you're so engrossed in your learning, you're so involved in your learning and you don't even hear a baby crying next to you? So what is your learning worth? And the last Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Menachem Mendel Schneerson, he wrote a letter one year for the Hasidim before Yat Kislev. And he brought this story. And he says, we learn from this story that even if a person is involved in spiritual growth, He's involved in the most, most important things. He can't ignore the crying of a baby around him. And the Babish Rebbe said the crying of the baby doesn't have to be the physical cry of an infant that fell out, out of his crib. Says the Babish Rebbe, there are many Jews that fell out of the crib of Yiddishkeit. 
because or maybe they weren't in the crib of Yiddishkeit to begin with. And maybe they're not crying with tears because they're not even aware of what they're lacking. But it's our job, he says, to be aware of and to be involved and to even close our Gemara if that's what's needed in order to go out and to take care of those crying. It's, it's, we can't only close ourselves in our homes and our base medrash and take care of our own spiritual welfare. We have to be involved with those around us. This is the message, the lesson that we learn from Avram Avinu. But of course, it's not only Avram Avinu that behaved in this way. Throughout Sefer Bamidbar, we read a lot about Moshe Rabbeinu and um, Moshe and Aaron. And in Sefer Shmos, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Moshe Rabbeinu, sorry, that it's time in Parshas Tetzaveh, after the, the, during the, 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 the building of the Mishkan, and the Kohanim, they're going to be the ones that are going to be offering the sacrifices. They're going to be makriv the Karbanos in the Mishkan. And there was a whole procedure that had to be done in order to prepare the Kohanim for, for the Avoda in the Mishkan. And the Torah tells us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Moshe, part of the process in preparing the Kohanim for the Avoda was to take a par, to take a bull, to shecht the bull, and to take the blood of the bull and to sprinkle the blood on the Kohanim. And, it was, and, and the Torah tells us that a Kodesh Baruch Hu was supposed to take Aaron to sprinkle the blood on Aaron's ear, on his right earlobe, and then to sprinkle the blood on the ear of his sons. And then to sprinkle blood on Aaron's thumb and on the thumb of his sons. And then to sprinkle the blood on Aaron's toe, and then the sons, the, the toe of his sons. Okay, so the process was to take the blood, to sprinkle on three body parts, the ear, thumb, and toe, each body part first, Aaron and then his sons. The next one, Aaron and his sons, Aaron and his sons. That's what Akadosh Baruch Hu told Moshe and Parshas Tetzaveh in Sefer Shmos. In the Sefer Vayikra, Parshas Tzav, that's where the Torah describes what Moshe Rabbeinu actually did. And if you look at the Pesukim there, it's clear that Moshe Rabbeinu changed from the Tzivui of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And instead of taking Aaron, sprinkling it on his ear, and then the ear of his sons, and then the, his thumb, and then his sons, that's not what Moshe Rabbeinu did. Rather, what did Moshe Rabbeinu do? He took Aaron, he sprinkled the blood on Aaron's ear, his thumb, and his toe, and only after he completed and finished sprinkling the blood on Aaron, did he move on to sprinkle the blood on Aaron's sons. Ask the Nitziv, why did Moshe Rabbeinu change from the Tzivoy? Why did he finish with Aaron and only then move on to his sons? That's not what Hashem told him to do. Hashem told him each body part, First Aaron, then his sons. Then the next body part, Aaron and his sons. Why did he finish and complete Aaron? He sprinkled the blood on him totally, and only then did he move on to his sons. Why did he change from the tzibur? Says the Nitziv, what happened between Sefer Shmos, Parshas Tetzaveh, and Sefer Vayikra, Parshas Tzav? What major occurrence took place? Says the Nitziv, after Parshas Tetzaveh comes Parshas Kisisa. Parshas Kisisa is Cheta Egel. As a result of Cheta Egel, Moshe Rabbeinu realized that he has to give special respect to Aaron. And he expressed that special respect by sprinkling the blood on Aaron completely and, but, and only then moving on to his sons. We'll see it in the words of the Ritziv in source number eight. The Egel, which took place between the Tzivoy, the commandment, which as we said was in Parashat Tetzaveh, and the Mase, and the actual performance of that Tzivoy, which took place in Parashat Tzav, in between was Mase Egel, and that was what Garam Ladavar, that's what changed 
That's what caused our, Moshe Rabbeinu to change from the Tzibur. And he says, Before the Maisei Egel, Aaron and his sons, they were all equal. They were on the same level. So why was Aaron chosen to be the Kohen Gadol? He was the father, he was the older one. So they gave him the respect and they appointed him the Kohen Gadol. But not that he was in a tremendous, a different level than then. They were, they were basically the same level. Aval, that was true up to the Egel. Aval la'achara Egel, shemasar nafsho Yisrael. But after the Egel, that Aaron was willing to be Moser Nefesh for Am Yisrael, Kamivuar Baraba, as is explained in Medrash Rabbah, Shimshil Liben Shechatar Achar Aviv, Achar Beit Aviv Hamelech. Amalo Padagogo Lama Zate Agea Tenli Baniachtor. Right, the Medrash brings a mashal for a, a son that wants to rebel against his father, the king. And he wants to dill, he wants to dig, to dig a tunnel in order to go and to harm his father, to rebel against his father. And the son of the king has a pedagogue, has a, a teacher. And the teacher says to the son, you know what, why should you dirty, dirty yourself with the digging? I'll dig for you. And then the king catches him and the king says to the teacher, I know why you did this. You did this to protect my son. You didn't want me to get angry at my son, and you said, I'll dig instead of you, so that if the king catches us, he'll put his anger out on me and not on you. So I understand, says the king to the pedagogue, you only did this out of your love for my son to protect him. Says the Nitziv, Kach Aaron, so to Aaron. Even though Aaron had an active part, in making the Egel, Mikol Makom Yada Kodesh Baruch Hu Shurak Mishum Ahavat Yisrael. Kodesh Baruch Hu knows that he only did it out of his tremendous love. Shemasar Nafsho V'Nishmato B'Shvilam. Aaron was willing not only to be Moser Nefesh, but even more than that, he was willing to be Moser Nishama. He was willing to give up his spiritual uh, well-being in order to protect Am Yisrael. And therefore, says the Ritzivu, Mishum hachi migialo biyichud ha-kiuna gdola. And therefore, Aaron earned the kiuna gdola, right? There's the famous joke of the person that comes to the rabbi and he says, Rabbi, I don't care what it takes. I don't care how much it costs. You must make me a coin. And the rabbi says, you know, to be a Kohen, that's a tremendous kavod. You go up first to the Torah, the Levim, wash your hands, you stand in front of the congregation giving blessings. That's a tremendous kavod. It's going to cost you a lot of money. He says, rabbi, I don't care what it costs. Make me a Kohen. So the rabbi says, okay, donate a million dollars to the shul and we'll make it happen. He writes out the check. The rabbi brings the holy waters, sprinkles, sprinkles it on his head, and he says, okay, you're a coin. But the rabbi says, but tell me, why was it so important for you to be a coin? So he says, my, my father was a coin, my grandfather was a coin, my whole life I've been dreaming to be a coin. So we know that that's ridiculous. Either you're born a coin or you're not. But there were two people in history that were not born Kohanim, and they acquired the kahuna during their life. Right? We know there were many Kohanim that acquired and paid money to become a Kohen Gadol. But how do you become a Kohen when your father was not a Kohen? There were two people in history that were not born Kohanim, they became Kohanim. Who were they? Aaron a Kohen, right? Amram, his father was not a Kohen, and all of a sudden Aaron becomes a Kohen. And also Pinchas, like we read last Shabbos. So what did they pay? How do you acquire kahuna? Says the Nitziv, you know how you acquire kahuna? You know how you become a Kohen? You have to be willing to be Moser, not only your nefesh, but to be Moser Nishama. When Aaron was willing to get involved in the Ege, because he realized that that's the only hope to save Kla Yisrael. I'll get involved with the Egel and I'll try to delay it. And in the meantime, Moshe Rabbeinu will come and I'll, that's how I'll save them. He's taking a risk here because he's getting involved and maybe 
the Egel will be ready before Moshe comes. And that's what actually happens. And they say to the Egel, Eile Elohecha Yisrael. And it's committed to, to, to a terrible sin. But why does Aaron do it? Because he has tremendous love for Kla Yisrael. And when he realizes that that's the only hope to save them, so he's willing to take the chance. Says the Nitziv, when Moshe Rabbeinu saw that Aaron was completely and totally devoted for Kla Yisrael, he's willing to forgo his physical welfare in this world. And he's willing to forgo on his spiritual welfare in the world to come. His most are not only nefesh, but his neshama also. Says the Nitziv, that's why Moshe Rabbeinu decided to sprinkle the blood totally on Aaron, and only when he finished with Aaron did he sprinkle the blood on his sons to show that Aaron Avinu, Aaron Akoin wasn't chosen to be a Kohen Gadol because he's the father. It's much more than that. He was chosen to be the Kohen Gadol because he's the only one that had tremendous devotion, Mesirus Neshama. That's how you acquire to become a Kohen. That's the price you have to pay to become a Kohen Gadol. The Nitziv says at the end, that Aaron was a Kohen, Yotar mi Pinchas, Shezacha lekuna gedola mishum shemasar nafsho al Yisrael. We saw last Shabbos that Pinchas also acquired Kehuna, because he was willing to be Moser Nefesh, and there was a Magefa in Am Yisrael, and he goes and he kills Zimri, but he's taking a chance, because he could be killed. And when Pinchas is willing to be Moser Nefesh, so that's what acquires that's how he acquires the kahuna. But the Nitziv says that Aaron was a greater level than Pinchas. Aaron yiterasa limso nishmato b'shvila. Pinchas says the Nitziv was willing to be Moser Nefesh. Sorry, Aaron. Pinchas was willing to be Moser Nefesh, but Aaron was even willing to be Moser, not only his Nefesh, but also his Nishama. But the truth is that the Meshech Chachma says the same thing that Aaron did, the same thing exactly, mysterious nefesh and mysterious neshama, Pinchas does the exact same thing. Where do we see that Pinchas was willing to be most of his neshama? Says the Meshech Achba last week's parsha. Why does the Torah tell us that Pinchas was ben Elazar, ben Aaron? Why do we have to give the yichus back to Aaron? Says the Meshech Achma that Pinchas did two things. He did, first of all, he was willing to risk his life. He goes to kill Zimri, knowing that there's a chance that he himself will be killed. So Pinchas is willing to risk his physical life, but he does something else. Says the Meshech HaChama HaSheini, the second thing that Pinchas does, Shehifkir et kol haolam haba vikine letovatam she Yisrael. The second thing that Pinchas does is that he's willing to forgo on his place in Olam Haba. Pinchas is willing to give up on his Olam Haba for the benefit of Kla Yisrael. Where do we see that Pinchas is willing to give up on his Olam Haba? The Pasuk says in Tilim, Vayamod Pinchas Vayifalel. And the Gemara says, Sha'asa plilutim kono. Pinchas comes to Shomayim, so to speak. He comes to Kaddish Baruch Hu, and he screams at a Kodesh Baruch Hu and says, Al ele yehargu elef mi Yisrael. There are two people sinning, and because of these two people, 24,000 are being killed in the Magifa. Where's the justice to Kodesh Baruch Hu? So Pinchas is talking harshly to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And the Gemara says that the Malachim come to Pinchas, and they say, what are you doing? You can't talk like, you can't talk like that to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. You can't talk like that. And the Gemara says, Bikshu sharet They wanted to kick him out. They wanted to kick him out and that he should lose his place in Olam Haba. Says the Meshech Chachma that when Pinchas does that, he's acting just like his grandfather Aaron. Aaron wanted to postpone them till the next day that Moshe Rabbeinu could come. So Asaha Egel, so he helped them prepare the Egel, and he said, It's better Akarish Baruch should be angry at me, and he shouldn't destroy Am Yisrael. 
for the benefit of Israel, Israel. So Aaron was willing to forgo on his place in Olam Haba for the benefit of Am Israel. So so too Pinchas. That Pinchas was willing to argue with the Kaddish Baruch Hu and risk his place in Olam Haba, the Toaliyut Hauma. For the, Abata, for the benefit of Am Yisrael and out of his tremendous love for them. So just like Aaron had tremendous love and he was willing to sacrifice his own spiritual world for the benefit of Klai Yisrael, so too Pinchas was willing to sacrifice his spiritual world. Just like Avram Avinu was willing to sacrifice the levels of, of Ruchnius that he could have reached, he didn't do that because he was concerned for the benefit of mankind and for his generation, so too Aaron and Pinchas sacrificed their own spiritual welfare in order to take care and concern for the people, for B'nai Israel around them. So we see a common denominator between Aaron, between Pinchas, and between Avram Avinu, and of course we find this phenomena by Moshe Rabbeinu as well, because after Chet Egel, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to destroy Klai Yisrael Chas B'Shalom. And Moshe Rabbeinu davins and begs forgiveness from HaKadosh Baruch Hu that Hashem should forgive Am Yisrael. And the Pasuk says there in Parashas Kisisa, Moshe Rabbeinu says to Hashem, Ve'ata, and now, Im tisachatatam, Hashem, if you forgive them, Ve'im ayin, and if not, Me'cheni nam isifrecha asher katafta. If you don't forgive them, erase me from your book, which you have written, erase me from the Torah. And this Pasuk is a difficult Pasuk. What does it mean, Ve'ata, and now, Im tisachatatam, if you forgive them, Ve'im ayin, and if not, Me'cheni misifracha asher katafta. So it's clear in the Pasuk, Hashem, Moshe Rabbeinu is asking, Hashem, if you don't forgive Bnei Israel, so then, please erase me from your book. But what is Moshe Rabbeinu asking on the chance that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will forgive them? Vata inti sachatatam, if you forgive them, so then what? The Pasuk doesn't say. So Rashi says, Vata inti sachatatam, if you forgive them, hareto, so then it's good. Eni omer lecha mecheni. So then I'm not going to ask you to erase me from your book. Im ayin mecheni, only if you don't forgive them, so then erase me, says Rashi v'zem mikra katsar. This is a short pasuk. It's ki'ilu that the pasuk is, is missing words. That, you have to, that the Torah let it up, leaves it up to us to add the missing words. Vata im tisachatatam, if you forgive them. So then, eini omer lecha mecheini, then don't erase me. And only if you do forgive, if you don't forgive them, so then, mecheini. That's how Rashi explains this pasuk. But there are other mefarshim that understand differently than Rashi. For example, the Malbim says no. The Malbim says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is, Moshe Rabbeinu is davening to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, please forgive them. And then Moshe Rabbeinu says, Ve'ata, im tisachatatam ve'imayim. Whether you forgive them, or whether if it's not, I don't care if you forgive them or not, I have one request of you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and that is, Mecheni misifracha asher katafta. Right? The Malbim in his word says, Ritzanolamar, Shatamitzitcha, you are Kaddish Bahu, you could be Yaholi Yotchitisachatatam. It could be that you'll forgive them. But Avalanuchi, Katsti Bechayai, Vabakesh, Shetimchesh me, Mesefra Chaim, Kitov Moti Mechayai, Ubeze Masar at Atzmolimita. Says the Malbim, Moshe Rabbeinu says to Kaddish Bahu, I have one request. And that request I'm asking of you, whether you forgive them, and whether if not, I don't care if you forgive them or not, I want that I should be erased. And what does it mean, Mecheni Mesifrecha Asher Katafta? Mesifrecha Asher Katafta does not only mean I should not be mentioned in the Sefer Torah. The Gemara in Rosh Hashanah learns from this Pasuk, Mesifrecha Asher Katafta, 
The Gemara, everyone knows that in Rosh Hashanah, there's Shlosha Sparim Niftachim. Three books are opened in Rosh Hashanah, Sefer Shal Tzadikim, Sefer Shal Beinonim, Sefer Shal Rishayim. Says Moshe Rabbeinu, erase me from all three. I don't want to be a Tzadik. I don't want to be a Beinoni. I don't even want to be a Rosh. I don't want to be anything. Why? Why is Moshe Rabbeinu saying this? So I heard a beautiful explanation. I heard it in the name of Levi Yitzchak Schneerson, the father of the last Lubavitcher Rebbe. And he said that after Chet Egel, a Kaddish Baruch who comes to Moshe Rabbeinu and he says, Heref mimeni vachalem. Let me be, I want to, I want to destroy Am Yisrael. So says Moshe Rabbeinu to Kaddish Baruch Hu, you can't destroy Am Yisrael. We know that the whole purpose of the world, Bereshis Baralokim is a Shamayim Bezaretz, Bereshit, Bishlu Yisrael Shinikru Reshit. The whole creation was for, the, for Am Yisrael to be in the world. If there's not going to be an Am Yisrael in the world, so there's no purpose for the world. The world will go back to Tovavo. You can't destroy them. Says HaKadosh Baruch Hu to Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, you're right, I know that. I'll destroy them, but I'll leave you, because they all sinned with the Egel, but you didn't, Moshe Rabbeinu. So you're a tzaddik, I can leave you, and I'll start a new Am Yisrael through you, Moshe Rabbeinu. So Moshe Rabbeinu says to himself, ah, so I, now I understand what's going on here. If I, Moshe Rabbeinu, would have sinned along with them, so then a Baruch Hu cannot allow himself to destroy all of us, because if he destroys all of Klai Yisrael, so there's no a continuation of the world. The world will go back to Tov Only because they sinned and I didn't, so a Baruch Hu could allow himself to destroy them because he has me to continue from. If that's the case, says Moshe Rabbeinu to himself, it could be that now I'll dive into a Baruch Hu and he'll forgive them. But what's going to be in the future? What's the guarantee that in the future he'll also forgive them? Maybe now he'll forgive them, but I know this nation. I, I know them. They're going to sin again in the future. And I know myself, says Moshe Rabbeinu, I'm not going to sin with them. So what's going to be? HaKadosh Baruch Hu at some point in the future again will have a thought, a have amina, maybe to destroy Am Yisrael because he has me around. Says Moshe Rabbeinu, if that's the case, What's the benefit of Am Yisrael? The benefit of Am Yisrael is that I should not exist. Because my existence may allow a Baruch Hu at one point in history to destroy Kla Yisrael. So if that's the case, I don't want to exist. Ve'ata, now that I understand the cheshben of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if that's the case, whether you forgive them or not, I don't care. I have one request of you, and that is, I don't want to be around anymore. I don't want to be in this world anymore, because my whole existence in the world is for the benefit of Klai Yisrael. And if my existence will allow HaKadosh Baruch Hu to harm them, so I don't want to be around. And I don't want to be around, not in this world, not as a tzaddik, not as a rasha, not as a beiruni, not in this world, not in the world to come. In other words, mecheni misifrecha shechatafta Moshe Rabbeinu is willing to forgo not only his world, his place in this world, but even in the world to come, he's willing to give it up. Why? Because he's not in the game for himself. He's here for Kla Yisrael. And if his existence will allow HaKadosh Baruch Hu even to have a thought in the direction of harming Klai Yisrael, so there's no purpose for him, there's no purpose for him to be here. We find this attribute of complete devotion to Klai Yisrael, like we saw by Avram Avinu, like we saw by Aram, like we see by Moshe Rabbeinu, we see it also by Yonah Hanavi, right? The Medrash tells us, Yalkut Shimoni, Source number 13, Rabbi Nasan Omer, Lo halach yona ele la'aber et atzmo bayam, shedeemar, sauni v'atiluni el ayam. V'chen ata motze ba'avot u'banviyim, shenatnu nafsham al Yisrael. V'moshe hu omer, v'ata im tisach atatam. Says the Medrash on this posuk, v'ata im tisach atatam about Moshe Rabbeinu, that Yona Hanavi behaves in the same form. Moshe Rabbeinu is willing to give up his life to protect Klai Yisrael. 
so too Yonah. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes to Yonah and tells him, go to Nineveh. Go to Nineveh and give them Musr, because they're sinners. And Yonah knows that he's going to go to Nineveh and he'll give them Musr, and they're going to accept his Musr. They're going to listen, and they're going to do Tshuva. And what's that going to cause? If Nineveh does Tshuva, but Am Yisrael don't do Tshuva, so that's going to harm B'nai Yisrael. That's going to make them look bad. Says, Yonah, I can't do that. I can't make my own brothers look bad in the eyes of a Kaddish Baruch I'm willing to give up my life and not to make B'nai Yisrael look bad. And it's interesting. We spoke before about Pinchas. And Chazal tell us that Pinchas is the Eliyahu. That somehow Eliyahu Anabi, he's the extension and the continuation of Pinchas. Pinchas was a Kanoi, El Eliyahu was a Kanoi. But we know that unlike Pinchas, that was willing to protect Am Yisrael at all, exp at all expense, Eliyahu didn't behave that way. And Eliyahu comes to Karish Baruch Hu and he tells him, Look how Bnei Yisrael are sinning. They've, they've left your covenant, they, they've transgressed your bris. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Eliyahu, if that's all you have to say, you have to talk bad about Am Yisrael, then I don't want you to be a Navi. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Eliyahu to appoint Elisha in his place. But we know one of the stories, one of the things that Eliyahu does in his lifetime, Eliyahu, he... There's the story with the Isha Tzarfati to Eliyahu lives by, and her son gets sick, and she goes to call Eliyahu, and Eliyahu brings him back to life. Chazal tell us, who was that child? Ben Isha Tzarfati. You know who he was? He grows up, and he becomes Yonah Hanavi. So that it comes out very beautiful, that even though Eliyahu Hanavi in his lifetime, he was not Melamit Tzchus on Am Yisrael. And that's why he comes to the bris every, every time, every day throughout history, he comes to experience the bris to, to see how Am Yisrael are keeping the bris of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But Elio himself didn't go out of his way to protect Am Yisrael, but he brought back to life the son of the Isha Tzorfatito, according to Chazal, was Yonah Hanavi, and Yonah Hanavi fixes that, and he's willing to give up his life in order not to harm Am Yisrael. We find this also by Moshe Rabbeinu, by the Chet of Mei Meriva. Because by the Chet of Mei Meriva, Moshe Rabbeinu, everyone knows, he hits the stone, and the Torah tells us, Bayomer Hashem el Moshe v'al Aaron, in source number 14, Yain lohe mantenbi l'hakdisheni l'hinei b'nei Yisrael, l'achen lo tabiu et ha'kahal hazeh, and Rashi tells us, what does it mean? It says Rashi, if you would have spoken to the rock and it would have brought out water after speaking to it, so that would create a Kiddush Hashem in the eyes of Bnei Israel. The Umrim, they would say, Ben Israel would say, if this stone that doesn't talk and doesn't hear and doesn't need parnasa, doesn't need to eat, and even so it obeys the word of Hashem, Kalvachomer us, Ben Israel, if a Kaddish Baruch tells us to do something, we have to listen. So why is it? Why did Moshe Rabbeinu not do this Kiddush Hashem? Why did he not speak to this stone? So says the Sefer Ber Moshe, Admor Mi Ozrov, Rav Moshe Yechiel Epstein, was a Rebbe in Tel Aviv. And uh, he says, you know why Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want to speak to the stone? Because Moshe Rabbeinu knew that he's going to speak to the stone and the stone will listen. And that's, but he knows that B'nai Israel, they're not going to learn the lesson. And that's going to cause B'nai Israel to look bad in the eyes of a Kodesh Baruch. And therefore, he dafka hit the stone, because also B'nai Israel know to listen after they're hit. They don't always listen when they're spoken to. And therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu did not want to speak to the stone, because speaking the stone 
will make Bnei Israel look bad. And we won't go through all the sources, try to finish on time in another five minutes, and then um, we we'll just see the words of the Mesila Sisharim in Perik Yutes, he says, Ki eina karishbohu ohev, ela lemisho hevet Israel. Who does a karishbohu love most? Those that have tremendous love for his children, for Bnei Israel. Vechol masha adam magdil ahavatol the Israel, the more a person enhances his love to Am Israel, gama karishbohu magdil alav, the more a karishbohu loves him. These are the true shepherds, the true leaders of Am Yisrael. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu desires. Which leaders does Hashem desire? Those that are Mosrim Atzmam Atzono. They're willing to totally be devoted, to give themselves up for their flock. They go out of their way to take care of their benefit. They're always willing to dive in. They're always looking to be melamed schus and to take care of their needs and to look out for their welfare. What is the similar to? Says the Mesila Shisharim. Who does a father like? He doesn't love anyone more than the person that he sees who loves his child. Right? If a father comes to a parent's teacher's meeting and he sits with the teacher and he sees that the teacher is going on and on, how he loves your child. So the father comes out and he says, wow, what, a, what an amazing teacher. How do you know he's an amazing teacher? You saw him teach a class? You don't know anything. But as far as you're concerned, what does the father care about? He wants to know that the teacher loves his child. If you love the, my child, I love you. So to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Which leaders does a Kaddish Baruch Hu love? Those that are completely devoted for their flock. Not those that are in it for themselves. Not those that care and they're willing to give up from themselves to take care of, of Bnei Israel. Maybe we'll end with a story. If Shlomo Karbach tells a story about the Magid from Kotsk, Menachem Mendel Mikotsk, and, uh, and Rabbi Yitzchak Mivarka. The Kotsker and Rabbi Yitzchak Mivarka were good friends. And uh, they made a deal, they made an agreement between them that whoever of them, as they were getting older, whichever one of them dies first, he promises that he'll come back in a dream to his living friend. And they'll tell him what's happening with him in Shammai. That was the deal that Rabbi Nachem Mendel Mikotsk made with Rabbi Yitzhak Mivark. And the years pass, and sure enough, Rabbi Yitzhak passes on to the next world. Rabbi Yitzhak Mivark passes away, and Rabbi Nachem Mendel Mikotsk is waiting to hear from his friend. They promised each other, whoever dies first will come in a dream, and tell his friend what happened with him in Shamayim. And sh the days of the Shiva passed, the days of the Shloshim passed, and he, has, he hasn't received any message from his dear friend. No WhatsApp, no SMS, what's going on here? And one day he's walking in the street, the Kotzker, and he sees the son of Rav Yitzchak Mivarka. He says, listen, have you heard from your father? And he says, no. That night, the Kotzker has a dream. And in his dream, he goes up to Shemaim to Gan Eden, and he goes to the Heichal of the Talmidei al Baal Shem Tov, and he says to them, here, the Talmidei al Baal Shem Tov, did you see my friend, Rabbi Yitzchak Mivarka? They said, yeah, we saw him, but he left. He's not here anymore. Where did he go? They said, try higher. Go to a higher palace in Shemaim. So he goes higher to the, to the Baal Shem Tov himself, the Gaon Vilna, and he says to them, did you see my friend, Rabbi Yitzchak? And again, they say to him, he was here, but he left. Where did he go? Try higher. So again, he tries higher, and again, he gets the same answer till he gets to a certain place, and they tell him, you want to see him? Go outside, you'll see a forest. Pass the forest, and you'll see a big river. There, at the edge of the river, you'll see your friend, Rabbi Yitzchak. He goes out, he passes the forest, 
He goes to the river, and there at the other side of the river, he sees Rav Yitzchak, who's standing with his stick, leaning on his stick, staring at the water. And he says to him, Rav Yitzchak, what are you doing here? And he says, I'm not leaving, I'm not moving from this water. And he says to him, what, are the, what is this water? He says, this water, these are the tears that Am Yisrael has to shed until Mashiach comes. And I said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I'm not willing to go into my Gan Eden. I'm not willing to enjoy my place in the world to come until you don't come and dry out this river of tears. That's a leader who's willing to forgo his place in the world to come because of his love and tremendous, well, and his, his tremendous love and the way he looks out for Kla Yisrael. We dive in three times a day. We daven that HaKadosh Baruch Hu should give us leaders that are concerned with one thing, the welfare of Kla Yisrael, and that will save us from much suffering. We, in our lives, we try to follow this path of looking out for those around us that will be a tikkun for the chet of sinas chinam, and we should be zoche for binyan bais shlishi bimhera biyamenu, and we should be able to join together in Beit Hamikdash bimhera biyamenu. Amen v'amen. Thank you very much. Yeah. Shkoyach. Shkoyach.